Hello and welcome to another Mobilytics video. I'm your host, Wakayu, and in this one, we are going to be giving you three tips to learn for every role so that each and every one of you can get diamond. We have isolated three tips that are specific to each and every role that if you focus on these and learn them over the next couple of games that you're playing, it will give you the best chance to succeed in the meta, not just now, but forever. Yeah, that's right. I said it. I stand by it too. And please let us know in the comments if you're in touching distance of diamond or it's something you want to achieve by the end of the season. Either way, hopefully these tips will help you. Please let us know if they do. And so let's begin with top lane. First up, you have to learn matchups. And that's because you heard of things like range top laner. You've heard of smite Janna top lane. You've heard of Hellbreaker. Top lane begins in champion select. Having blind pickable champions for when you are picking before your opponent is obviously a very nice thing, but that is impossible in the longest lane. So having a good pool of counter matchups and a good sense of how your champion works into the majority of enemy picks is something we highly recommend. And obviously that comes from experience, but also watching replays, looking at statistics, understanding your champion inside and out. And some champions just have way too many counters to blind pick, so you need to have a backup pick for those scenarios. Obviously this matters for mid lane, it matters for jungle, it matters for ADC, but it matters most in the solo lane where you are bound to get less interaction from your jungles and support than any other position. In game, a huge part of playing top lane is obviously taking this to the next level. You've read about it, you're upset about the matchup and your champion select, and now you actually have to play the game. The most important point about this is that not every matchup is won in the first three or four levels. For example, if you're playing Fiora into Jax, playing around your repost and his E are huge factors as to whether you win or lose the lane. And if you're against set Jax and you play someone else that's perhaps a good tank, then it's okay to simply lose lane gracefully and make your impact felt in the macro sense and the team fighting sense. Obviously, you will not be able to match the Jax in split pushing. If you're playing Jace into Aurelia, you know that this is a difficult lane and you'll need to focus on scaling without hard losing again, losing gracefully and never becoming irrelevant. There are tons of different scenarios, factors and variables that make this applicable. So to boil it down, stick to a few champions and a core champion pool that you will need to learn the pros and cons about every single matchup and it will be more beneficial to learn meta champions first as when you eventually customize your own champion pool, you know exactly what to pick into Riven, for example. She's very strong, you can play her, you can understand what she does and when you don't want to play Riven anymore and you have a more niche champion pool for your own playstyle, you will know exactly how to handle it. The next tip for top lane is all about pushing and abusing leads. Top lane is an island, as I've already mentioned, so if you sit there and beat your lane opponent without doing anything else, you aren't going to have much control over the result, and you will be coin flipping just like your enemy top laner despite being in the lead, because if you have a lead, you use it on your own lane, you don't use it on the map, now what? It's all about learning which ways you can affect a game based upon your champion. For example, let's say you're playing Malphite top and you've got a few kills. Even if you don't, are you going to sit back in lane and just farm, or is it better to shove, walk down the river for a free mid lane gank with your ultimate? Post 14 minutes, if you're ahead, you could also be looking for those unleashed prestige teleport opportunities to influence the rest of the game around dragon fights, herald fights, and baron fights. But be careful, if you join in a losing fight too late because you don't use your F keys to click around the map, you could give up your bounty and make the game harder for yourself and your team when you have the lead. Also remember, if you are hard losing or your team is hard losing and you don't feel you can help with those teleport, start playing a bit more aggressively in the top lane. Look to force two or three people to rotate to you, simply disengage, pay attention to the map, and now you can pull away from that scenario and roam TP to something else where you do have the numbers advantage. Always play the numbers game. And if a top laner can be a huge factor in terms of pressure release if your team is actually losing. And likewise, if you are losing and your team is winning, it's okay to simply leave the lane and make a macro play. If he has ignite and you have TP, I'm absolutely okay giving a few plates to give more leads to my teammates that are already winning. And of course, if you're a Malphite, you will always be useful. Just hit that button. Now, obviously in a long lane, you have to talk about wave management. And this is a pretty huge thing in all lanes, but when you have a long lane and rough matchups and maybe the jungle is interfering as well, maybe your jungler doesn't push and sets up a freeze for the enemy, it's rough. You have to understand what to do, how to fix it and how to abuse it. If you base at the wrong time in a certain matchup, you can instantly lose lane from it. And before you know it, you're down two levels and you're listening to Opeth's number under the weeping moon because it's you. You're weeping. Wave management can be pretty daunting, but there are simple fundamentals to it to make sure you aren't shooting yourself in the foot, which is, you know, step one of using a weapon. That's even more impressive if you have a sword. A minion wave will either A, push towards you, or B, push towards them, or C, stay in the middle. You can control where the wave goes by attacking minions in particular ways, and depending on these matchups, you can win lane from it. There are several different ways to control waves, and these can be beneficial to you for certain purposes. We've broken it down into freezing, stacking, and crashing waves. Nice introductory trifecta. Setting up a freeze allows you to force your opponent off of all farm. You can zone them, and you can keep the lane in a desired position, which is closer to your tower, where if they walk up, you can either kill them or of course punish them, but it's also worse if the enemy jungler is away and your jungler is playing on this side. Imagine that, right? 
But this is absolutely huge if you can prepare this nicely when you have someone who's vulnerable to ganks like say an early game Kale. You just want to keep the game in a very good position when you're against her, but not if you are her. If you happen to be the Kale, then you would just want to be on the other side of the freeze, keeping her close to your tower so that you can be safe. Stacking a wave can be really beneficial for setting up those dives. You have a Rek'Sai, you have a Lee Sin, you have an Elise. If you know your jungler is pathing towards the top side, again imagine that, but you can actually prefer a juicy and large wave so that it hits their turret as you dive and this means you have more time to dive and also if you kill them they will lose multiple minion waves and of course you get plates. Stacking a wave is also a great idea to set up a roam. If your top laner has two waves under their tower, especially a cannon wave, they're gonna have to give all that up if they want to follow you and most laners are obsessed with their cannon minion the same way junglers are obsessed with crab until Riot gutted it. Crashing or bouncing a wave means basically getting it under the enemy turret and getting the turret to help kill them so that you can reset the wave and start getting it back into your desired location. Fortunately, Mobilitics has an absolutely huge wave management article which we should link in the description below, which can break down these techniques further and give you a few more fundamentals. Wave management is a huge part of gaining, keeping and exploiting your leads and is also a great way to win bad matchups just by applying this when your enemy may not understand it. If you're against an autofilled jungle, I can guarantee you you can win lanes just by doing this properly. And you might be thinking, I'm silver, so surely this doesn't really matter in my elo. Everyone perma pushes, so who cares? Yeah, but then it's just basically like being the one dude in the Middle Ages that has electricity. How powerful would you be versus everyone else in that entire world? It's the same thing here. No one knows wave management doesn't mean you should not know wave management. If you want to climb and get to diamond above them, become better than them. And on that note, let's shift over to the jungle. Ganking and farming priority is obviously the most important aspect of jungling. I talk about this all over my main channel just to make sure that people are always thinking about do I need to gank, do I need to farm, what's a good balance and we are in a hybrid meta at the moment so it's important to understand their relationship. If you want to AFK farm and not gank, well basically you're coin flipping your lanes. Your lanes are basically left to say listen if you guys win you win, if you lose you lose. Thing is they have a jungler as well so if that jungler goes for ganks, and yes, ganking is high variance, especially in a lot of low elos, but if there's a Leona, it's kind of difficult to mess that up. And if they show three, four times in the same lane, it's unlikely that your laners are going to respect that and not die at least a couple times. Then again, if you are the dude perma ganking while the enemy farms and you don't get success from these ganks because you just play them like a lizard, well, they're going to steal all your camps, all your CSs, get objectives and be two, three levels ahead of you. You need a happy balance. This will depend on your champion choice as well as your matchup. If you're a Warwick and Elisa Rex, obviously there's more focus on you actually ganking early. But with those champions, make sure you assess which lane you want to gank and have a good first clear and second clear such that you don't fall behind early and you still have good control of your experience. For an Evelyn, for a Karthus, you're definitely more focused on abusing these ganking windows to farm and counter jungle such that we can get six as soon as possible. And if you're facing some of those champions, use that window, go ahead. Just track where they are and don't give them free ganks through counter ganks because you don't actually understand what a map is. Then you have things like Diana who can do both very, very well. Healthy balance between a do easy first clear and crab control, can easily look for a gank in the first rotation, come back, look for another gank and then resequence again. Look to fill the time between your sequences with ganking and then of course when your ult is up, use it. If you don't gank properly and you lose a lot of CS, you're going to be behind and if you're not a farming jungler, you can't just say, okay, now I'm going to farm. Couple sequences, I'll be back in the game. If you're a slower farmer than the enemy jungler and you're behind, the only way you get back into it is with good ganks and, you know, making some desperate plays and you never want to be in that scenario. So a couple tips just to think about. Look to take the outermost objective on the map before you reward yourself with your own camps. That means if there's a crab, a dragon and the enemy jungle is away, you can secure those, fall back to your camps afterwards. Don't do your camps and then look for those things. Look for the outermost advantages that you can get, use them to translate to nice gangs and if that's not possible, now we can fall back to our camps. Also make sure when you make good plays on one side of the map, you take the dragon and you want to go to the herald, finish your blue quadrant, go back to base and now you know that you can go to the top side Forget about being counter jungle because there's nothing to count on jungle. And when you go back to the bottom side, you will have some fresh camps for you to snack on. At the end of the day, gank assessment in the early game when you're an early game jungler is the most important thing because farming junglers, you can simply play around your ultimate and look for counter ganks through tracking. It is low variance and it is very good to climb at a low elo, but you do need to understand ganking etiquette, otherwise you will be doomed. Next up we have being a dynamic jungler means being proactive as well as reactive. This means you need to be able to adjust your game plan as the game goes on depending on all the things that can happen and trust me, they all can and will happen. For example, you might think, hey top lane, that looks nice and juicy to gank, I'm gonna do that. Then he goes and ints. So now what? Well, it's pretty easy. You can take a crab gank mid lane and now focus on the bottom side which might actually have a cure or look better in the current game state. Remember this one tip I always put in my videos. Do not play what should be, 
play what is. Even if your top laner should be creaming and destroying the enemy lane, it doesn't matter. If they're down, you know, three, four kills, there's nothing you can do about it. Adapt and focus on the next win condition you can see. Might be you, but it also might be your bot lane or your mid lane. And the other most important thing is, of course, reactive pathing. This is my own term that I use on my channel again a lot because I'm a jungle YouTuber. I'm going to reference that. But when you see mid lane getting ganked, don't finish your wolves. Leave the wolf camp, rotate, make it a 2v2. They've wasted their spells on your mid laner. You can very often get good cleanup. The camps will be there afterwards. Your mid laner might not be. You also need to understand equal and opposite plays. If the enemy jungler dives top lane and falls back to the herald, don't finish your quadrant and then decide to go to the dragon. Go to the dragon now, do some counter jungling, invade above, dive bot lane, look to make plays where the enemy jungler is not. Yeah, we need to be proactive in our game planning and thinking what we want to do, but you also need to reactively path in the case the enemy jungler and your laners do what you don't expect. And now obviously the strategic thing, think about the bigger picture. There's a long term impact to your jungle decisions, and this is something in coaching I have to talk about a lot. We'll focus, you know, 10, 20 minutes on just like the first four minutes of the game because everything that happens afterwards is just a chain reaction. The dominoes falling of your own stupidity or your own genius. Think about what's actually going to happen throughout the course of the game. Think a couple moves ahead. If I do this, what's the enemy jungler going to do if he knows I'm doing it? For example, if you play around a certain lane and get them ahead, what does that actually mean for the outcome of your game? What if they just take that lead and keep pushing and dying multiple times? What were you doing with that lead and the pressure that they had? Even if they threw the lead you gave them, it's important for you also to play your own game and foresee what might happen and understand. You know, if they rotate with you to other towers to take those, cool. If they don't, what can you do that still pushes the game forward in a good direction? It can also be more simple. If you're camping, you know, a scion who's hellbreak and doesn't care if they die because they just take the turrets with them, you could just be wasting your time. Why not try some ganks in the mid lane or the bottom lane? Likewise, ganking a Malphite. You know, you might have a carry top laner, but if you kill Malphite 14 times, he just has to press the magic button in a 5v5 and they can win. Whereas even if Malphite beats your laner and gets fed, if you've got a really well fed and good positioning ADC with some nice peel, they can deal with that Malphite in a very easy way. Things like if a bot lane equals more dragons, if a top lane equals more heralds. Where do you want to get your advantages from? Which champions do you want to play around? And which is the best way for you to close and win the game? If you gank bot lane here and then take a dragon and the enemy jungler makes a mistake, well now you can take herald as well and think about winning the whole map, which is always the dream. If that sounds complicated, that's because it is. Jungling is. It is a chess match and you have to track the enemy jungler and account for what they're doing as well. Right, let's shuffle on down to the mid lane. The first thing here is understanding your champion's role and executing it because different mid lane champions have different playstyles and different goals. That's because mid lane has the biggest diversity of champions in it compared to all the other roles. There's a lot of different playstyles that go with it, artillery or control mages, assassins, bruisers, duelists, fighters, and even some things like Ivor. All of these different types of champions have their own ways to win games and it's incredibly important that you know what these are. If you're playing an assassin like Zed, you need to focus on getting a lead either through lane or roaming to other lanes and then use that to remove high priority targets from play, like a Jinx. You can do this throughout games by controlling vision, side laning, flanking and so on. If you're playing an artillery mage like Zerath, you want to look to siege and poke, pick off enemies with long range abilities and generally just win the game through landing those high powered skill shots consistently. If you're playing a mage with utility like an Orianna, you want to stick near your important allies. Keep them alive, pump out the damage, look for big ultimates and teamfights, and really optimize what your champion is capable of, and that of course includes, you know, itemization. A large part of this comes down to understanding your own champion and understanding that as you put together your champion pool with these different styles, it's imperative that you know the difference between them and how to win games with them. If you're playing Zed and you're constantly 5v5ing like an Orianna should, likewise if you're trying to be an assassin with Orianna, you know, you're trying to backline someone with no other setup, you're just gonna whiff your spells. You can use your lane and the lead very, very quickly. Given that this is, of course, a very short lane, punishing easy lanes is a huge part of playing mid lane. If you're not punishing a matchup you should be punishing, then you're just wasting your advantage. If you have a favored matchup, you should not just be farming. You should be looking for opportunities to gain a big advantage and really shut down your enemy laner. Make their lives miserable. Use that prior for deep wards, track the jungler, move around the map. But if you're in a losing matchup, there are ways you can navigate this. Use the aforementioned wave management to make sure you're positioned as close to your tower as possible, nice and safe. Obviously you can get dove if you don't have a jungler and they do, but at least you're trying your best in this particular situation to not feed. You should also consider recall timing. If you manage to get base at the right time and get an item advantage over them, it might open up a brief trading window where you can actually abuse them and that's why pressing tap to look at items is very important. If you are doing a 2v2 for example with both junglers, look and see, maybe your jungler's got a completed mythic and theirs does not. Use this to your advantage, play around them. But as soon as you see that cannon wave come along, get to base, get back to lane and take it out on your enemy. 
However, the classic mobile assassin move is, you know, if the lane is good, if the lane is bad, I don't really care. I'm losing. I'm just going to sacrifice some waves, go dive bot lane. I'm going to sacrifice some waves. I'm going to dive top lane. This is obviously risky and you're a little bit of coin flipping the scenario, but at the same time, you're not because you're using numbers advantage to gain leads on the map for yourself and for your team. If you're just sitting under tower, not able to farm, not getting experience, you can't kill your lane. They're just getting free plates. You're already coin flipping anyway, so you might as well take another high risk play that will have bigger payoff compared to the payoff you have now, which is just nothing. It's also great if people die, you know, in those roams. It's unfortunate that you have to push the wave and take a plate yourself. You know, that's not so bad. And now maybe you can actually kill your laner because you have an item and they don't. Finally, you need to understand when and how to influence the map, even when you're not losing and just taking a high risk play. This is similar to top lane. This is similar to bot lane. This is similar to everyone. It's a PvP game. You have to move around the map. If you only have it in lane, you never had it. On some mid lane champions though, this is a lot more obvious than others. For example, if you're playing Twisted Fate and you're 5-0, you can press R, gank another lane, hit that gold card, and you're good to go. However, if all you're doing is sitting in lane and slowly beating a mid laner who's keeping up with the farm and are just a few kills down, you're not really doing enough to win with your lead. Mid lane is an amazing role. It is the amazing role to influence your game. You are in the center of the map, which means geographically you can hit both side lanes equally. And this is what's quite funny about top laners. They don't seem to understand basic geography. You're in a 1v1 lane. The other side is a 2v2 lane and the scaling objective that gets you soul. Why would you have as much agency over that side of the map? And if you artificially boost it, it becomes way too difficult to balance because if one lane just wins through counterpicking, all of a sudden they get scaling heralds or whatever you want to put there, and it's almost impossible to actually come back from this. A discussion for another time, but as a mid laner, you can definitely assist your jungler when you win with an invade or fight in the river. You can run bot to the dragon, to the herald, you can look for dives as we've already said. If you're playing a mid lane champion who has the ability to roam with a lead and a kit that can gank, you should be using it. And that works for Xerath and Ziggs as well, by the way. You've got a nice big ult. There are, however, a few main ways that you can allow yourself to roam easier. Firstly, if you slow push a lane, get a stacked wave and force that into the enemy turret, similar to what we spoke about in the top lane wave management section, your enemy has to choose whether to follow you or to give up all of those minions. It's also worth noting that you kind of zone them out because they have to pass behind their tower and their jungle. They kind of just cut through wherever you're going. You can also look to roam when you base. If the lane is even or pushing when you recall, this is a fantastic time to roam as not only will you have just base, so you probably have got an item spike, but you also probably won't get pinged missing by the enemy mid. They just think you based. Sounds like a double kill in the bot lane to me. Right, let's take ourselves to the bottom lane here where we need to be as efficient as possible. We need to maximize my farm. We need to minimize losses when receiving all of the attention because that's what will happen as the AD carry. Remember, at the end of the day, you're the thing that takes objectives and towers the fastest. At the end of the day, you're the thing that's going to scale to six items and become very, very difficult to handle. So teams will try and focus you at all stages. That and they also kind of want the dragons. And because you scale so well, you're kind of weak in the early game. And the most important thing about being an AD carry in Season 12 Keg W is understanding how to minimize those losses while receiving all of the attention. Being efficient as an AD carry is difficult. It's going to take some practice. It's a skilled position mechanically, some discipline. It's going to take hard work. But if you can mold yourself into this type of player, safe, intelligent, with measured aggression and good mechanics, you will without a doubt win a lot of games. What I mean is by being efficient, learn base timings. Make sure you aren't missing stacked minion waves. Pay attention to jungle and dragon fights. Don't sit farming. Go and impact those fights. Get kills. That's where you really snowball your lane. And we haven't really spoken about it, but simply outplaying your enemies even when you're under duress and stress is just mechanical outplays and it's something huge for AD carries. Now, if you're getting dove by four enemies at level four, timing those summoner spells and cooldowns is most important. Yeah, you're going to die. If you can grab one with you, that's great. But pay attention to the sums used and don't waste yours if you really don't need to because you can use that in subsequent trades or ganks from your jungler. If you are doing all of these things correctly, then you are undoubtedly influencing the game in some small way. If you're receiving all of the attention and you're still getting something out of it, you are influencing the game. You're allowing the rest of your team to take control, waiting for your time to shine. Now, this might not always happen in solo queue, but if you're consistently losing gracefully, minimizing your losses or simply snowballing lanes you can snowball, you will win and you will climb. Now, on the subject of those mechanics, you need to go into customs, you need to go into practice tool, you need to use attack moving. One of the biggest problems with league players is that they just spam games. Game upon game upon game, they don't practice fundamentals. Now, with my jungle coaching and videos, as some of you will know, I tell them, go into practice tool, make sure your clears are perfect because the clears, if you get that fundamental down, can just win you games by accident in low elo. Same thing here with AD carries. So what is a typical game for an AD carry? You farm for 20 minutes and then you hope you can pull off some spicy mechanics and teamfights 
But how often do you guys ever really feel in control and actually get to those teamfight smurf moments? And then when you do, how often do you whiff it? And no, I don't mean Amaranth's new store, I mean you just don't get to practice this part of your game a lot. So get into a custom game and practice attack moving, weaving auto attacks and abilities and your champion's ability combos on those practice dummies that deserve every smack that they get. Go to YouTube, look up your favorite ADC, look up their key bindings, try and practice those settings and make sure you get something that's comfortable that you can get to muscle memory level with so that you're not thinking about these things when those fights happen. Use the Mobilytics app to practice all your AD carry champion combos in practice or frequently. Warm up, do some CSing, do some practice dummy smacking and then go into games. And when you get those close fights pre-6 around level 9, 20 minutes in, 25, 30 minutes in, you'll just be getting better and better mechanically and a good mechanical AD carry is a winning AD carry. On that note though, you might have the mechanics of a Vienna Sausage. So you need to pick champions based on your strengths. Are you a lane stomper? Are you a mechanical hyper carry monster? Are you a utility cross map ash alter? Too many players try and force themselves to play Draven because it's OP when you smurf and you can ego. Too many players want to play Vayne because Vayne. Or something about season two split pushing double lift. And no, I know Kai's is a great champion, but you're not Uzi. If you're an aggressive early game player and you're trying to one trick Cogmo because you think he's cute, you're doing it all wrong. Pick up Draven, learn to catch those axes and you'll be diamond in no time. Seriously. If you're someone who struggles in lane and you prefer to carry in team fights, you want to scale, you want to bing chill in your tower for 20 minutes, maybe you have a Lulu friend, a Yumi friend, play Cogmo, play Jinx, play Vayne. The worst thing you can do is pick a champion that you either don't enjoy or don't gel with because you think they're OP. This is a general point for any role really, but if you simply are not mechanical, don't pick AD carries that require you to be mechanical. If you prefer teamfight utility and macro, then an Ash can be absolutely exquisite for you using that ultimate appropriately, and you can also smurf in lane as well. Fruit for thought my friends, fruit for thought. And finally we have the Supportas. Here you need to understand 2v2 matchups, level 2 all-ins, power spikes, and win conditions. We've spoken about matchups, you know, in the top lane section, but that applies here very much as well, except there's, you know, four champions total. That means you need to understand that just because you can all in level 2 as Leona, maybe your AD carry doesn't want to. I'm a Zyra main, so I know when I have a Leona, I need to try to get level 2 pride just to create some sort of zone, but I know as soon as Leona hits 2 and 3, I'm going to get all in, so I create my spacing accordingly. You also need to know when you win lane or when you spike in these lanes. For example, as Bard against the Cow, you're probably only going to win at level 1 and then you can't do much until you're level 6. This means bot lane and your support position is taking a massive test of knowledge. So because you don't have to CS, yes, you know, think, because that's the least you can do here. Likewise with double engage, you know, you might think, oh, I'm Pike, level 2, I can kill anyone. Your AD carry doesn't want to and the enemy team has a Nautilus, so you're squashed. Now roaming is the art of the map, it's about reading things, understanding tempo control for multiple positions, working with your jungler, working against the enemy jungler, working against the enemy support. You need to know when those opportunities happen, or when you're actually hurting your AD carry. You need to make sure you aren't losing out on too much experience when you roam at a bad time, because if you come back to the lane, your AD carry's been 2v1, they've gotten two plates, now you're down on experience, down on gold, and you cannot win a 2v2. So don't roam when you're winning a 2v2 for no particular reason other than, hey, I need to roam because I saw it in pro play. Don't roam when you have your AD carry frozen against the enemy team and they just have to sit there getting zoned without farm. You know what's going to happen? They're going to overextend, they're going to get engaged on and they're going to die. You also don't want to roam necessarily when they're being hard shoved 2v1 because you know they're going to get dove, they might even get 3v1. Why are you moving at that particular moment? So what do you need to think about when you're roaming as a support? Well, if you get a good 2v2 trade early and now perhaps you've killed them, the wave is crashing, you go back to base, you can actually drive by the mid lane, look for a gank and then rejoin bottom lane absolutely fine. This can also work out against you though, because if you kill the enemy bot lane 2v2, they see you push, they see you reset, the enemy support knows in this particular case that the AD carry can go get solo experience on the tower holding it and he can roam mid lane before you can and then rejoin his AD carry who's got solo experience, a level lead and as you guys return to lane yourselves. It's also great to roam when weird things happen and perhaps your AD carry can finish pushing themselves, there's no threat. You can go to base, now your spawn timers are disparate, they're separated. So this happens either through you actually dying, which is unfortunate, and your AD carry then returns to base after you, or it happens in a good situation where you can just base before them. In both situations, you're on the map 20 to 30 seconds before your AD carry. Don't go bot lane and vape, go to the mid lane, go to the top lane, invade with your jungler, take a dragon, Go invade their blue buff, there could be easily something for you to do in those 30 seconds and then once you're done with that, join your AD carry again. If they've been zoned off a little bit, that's fine, you'll get back to the lane by the time it crashes and now you can carry on doing 2v2 things. That's just a small sampling and things I thought about randomly on the top of my head, how I like to play the game. There are a lot more obviously complex ways to roam and things you need to look for. And finally, appropriate itemization. 
Don't just autopilot the same items and think about what the game needs. Again, this can be applied to every single position, but you've got to think about it. You're a support, you're a low econ, whether you're a mage, a tank, or an enchanter, your items need to be perfect or you're going to be wasting those limited gold incomes that you have. Try not to follow the same generic item build in terms of, you know, you might have the same mythic, but the second, third item. It's one of the most diverse roles for itemization as well. And even if you can build full AP, you can also build supportive, you can also build tanky. So be aware of your champion's options. Support items and actives alone are incredibly useful and very important. So understanding all of them and their purposes is a huge part of the role as well. Let's talk about mythic choices, for example. Blitzcrank has three. Even Trout, if you want to stomp and you're ahead. Locket for defensive capabilities and protecting your team against AoE damage and dives and Shirelia's battle song for the engage mega turbo stump run around hook threat that the enemy team always hated. You can also amp some damage by the way, you've got a Master Yi, Ardent Sensor, Staff of the Flowing Water for your heavy mage comp, Knight's Vow to absorb damage and protect your carry, though that item isn't very good at the moment. They all provide something based upon what your champion might be able to provide themselves. But outside of this, you also have utility choices. Mikhail's Blessing to cleanse and heal. You can be any champion and build that. You also have Redemption for AoE healing on the map, and that, and that by the way, improves your shielding and healing power. So don't build it if you're Zyra, but if you're a Jenna, obviously, yes. And in terms of mage itemization, yeah, just like mid lane, you pick the one that suits your champion and what suits the game state the best. But because you are a support, you know, just picking that second void stuff, that second Zhonya's, that second Shadow Flame, you might not get to third item and frequently you don't. So that second item can do a lot of work if you itemize it correctly. Do you need Morellas as well? So it's not just the mythic you need to think about if you happen to be a damage dealing support. It's that second item because those two items are the thing you're going to see the game through with. It's important that you're actually doing stuff specifically because you're looking to peel as well. Just because you do damage doesn't mean you can't peel. So if you're dealing with all those tanks, then that penetration can be huge. If there are only squishies and you want to one shot them, then you're not itemized accordingly. But there you have it. Three tips for every single role with a lot of cross pollination. So hopefully if you watched this whole video and I hope you did, the tip should help you no matter what role you play. Thank you very much for watching. Please do like, share and comment if you did enjoy and learn something. Don't forget to subscribe to Mobilelytics' channel for all the cool content coming very soon. Don't forget to download the companion to have all the information you need at your fingertips whenever you play. I've been your host Vakayu and as always I will see you all in the next video or when they want someone to record for 30 minutes without stopping.